Witness history. Witness stories. Witness survival. Witness the power of a picture. I absolutely remember the first time I saw this photograph of Kim Phuc in um, 1972 because uh, she and I are of the same age and seeing that she was a young Asian girl, I go, wow, that girl kind of looks like me. Why is she naked? And what's wrong with her? Why is she running scared? There are soldiers behind her. And her face was agape in terror and fear and uh, utter horror. I wondered why aren't the soldiers behind her helping her? And why are the kids surrounding her have their clothes on? Were they lucky enough to escape the bombing, but they were just running scared down the road. When I look at this picture and see the expressions of all these people, it's disbelief. It's not anger, it's just total, utter fear. What is it about a photograph that draws us in? A frozen moment that allows us to immerse ourselves in that split second. We can study it, live it, feel it. A split second where everything comes to a halt. This photograph, taken June 8, 1972, won the Pulitzer Prize, but its impact is immeasurable. You know, I shock. I say, I, that's why I say I want to help her. I want to help her that day. Los Angeles Associated Press photographer Nick Oot took that picture. He's been working in LA for more than three decades, but he is from Vietnam. Forty years ago, he was standing on Highway 1 outside of a small village called Trang Bang and snapped that photo of a nine year old girl named Kim Phuc. Her clothes burned off her body by napalm. To mark this 40th anniversary, I accompany Oot back to Trang Bang. Like every other newsroom, we're saying, where is the girl? We are joined by Christopher Wayne, a former British TV reporter who also was there that day. While Nick photographed the incident for print, Wayne's crew captured it on film for television. Innocent victims have always been a part of war, but never before had such a vivid example been captured. What happened that day to that small village has happened a thousand times before in the war. But this time, there was somebody there to shoot it and show the world. This will be Wayne's first time back since that day. You see the calculator that wouldn't move. The reunited journalists noticed so much has changed. So where were you when the napalm actually went? I was down right here on the highway, down right here. Gee. But walking through the village, memories come back to them in vivid detail. And so he came in from there yeah. and just overshot. And the two slowly pieced together the events that unfolded that day. The North Vietnamese troops were trying to take control of the town. South Vietnamese were defending, and the villagers were caught in the middle. The temple, the focal point of the incident, is still here. This is where the nightmare began. Kim Phuc and her family, as well as other villagers, were inside the temple thinking they were safe. But then the Vietnamese bombers started moving in, dropping their bombs. In fact, you could see on the film the explosions going on all around the building. And that set off a panic. Villagers started thinking the temple was being targeted. So they ran out those doors through this gate right here and kept running in that direction down Highway 1. We could see them pouring out of the temple and running towards us. And that was when the second plane came in and it dropped these four canisters of napalm straight across them. Four canisters of napalm hit right here, hitting deep into the bushes right over there and rolling in this direction, covering the road into the trees over here. This entire area was engulfed in flames. And the effect was like somebody opening an oven door. We were a good 400 yards away and we felt this heat. And uh, it, was, it was one of the worst things I've ever seen. Out of the smoke, a horrific scene unfolds. Villagers running in terror. Two women carrying babies appear, desperate for help. There was none. Both children are terribly burned. One appears to have charred clothes hanging off its body. But that is actually skin. Neither child survives. Two minutes would go by, and then Nick would spot the silhouette of a young girl. Then I looked at black smoke. I saw, foot I saw, Little Kim Pook naked. I don't know her name that time, but her arm like this. 
I keep shooting, shooting, the picture came running. The thing I always remember was that they, they were absolutely silent. There was no sound from them until they saw us. When they saw us, then they started to cry and shout. But until that point, they were, I suppose, in shock. Then when she passed my camera, I saw her body burn so badly. I said, oh my God, I don't want no more pictures. She screaming, crying, I, she said, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And I uh, need some water, need water. I run with water her body. I want to help her. I said, no more picture. I want to help Kim Phuc right away. Even though the South Vietnamese Army dropped the bombs on their own villagers, it made no effort to help the injured. Journalists were all that was left who could help. So I gave her a drink of water. If you want to recognize me, then look at the watch. I, I always wear my watch on the inside, and you'll see, see that. In this photo, Chris can be seen kneeling in front of Kim, doing what he can to help, while other members of the media look on in disbelief. Nick would then drive her to the hospital. It would be an agonizingly long and difficult trip, but they made it. He gets Kim admitted to the hospital. Nick is overjoyed. Then I'm so happy I leave in the hospital. And in the van, I had to pray, my brother, keep him good luck, good luck. Nick's brother, Mi Thon Hyun, was his idol, his mentor. Nick called him Bai, which means seven. Mi was the seventh born. Before the war, Bai was a Vietnamese movie star who quit acting to become a photographer for the Associated Press. Bai was always searching for that magic picture that would turn the world against the war and stop the killing. He was talented and brave, perhaps to a fault. In 1965, he was shot in the Mekong Delta, and while receiving aid in a field hospital, it was overrun by the Viet Cong. Bai was executed. Everyone show up to my brother's funeral. This is Nick at his brother's funeral, only 14 years old. I cry a lot after that. He loved me so much. I love him too, my brother. He always take care of me, and he he want he asked me he want to become a photographer. Nick went to his brother's boss looking for work. They gave him a job in the dark room. He constantly studied the pictures coming in, learning the craft. Eventually, becoming a combat photographer just like his brother. So that's why Nick, after leaving the hospital, began to pray to his brother. I didn't pray to that, I prayed to my brother. He said, my brother, please. I remember you tell me to stop it war. I wanted a picture, maybe this one. Maybe stop it war. When he developed his film, he couldn't believe what he found. And I looked for negative, number seven. Number seven, his brother's name. That now famous picture was the seventh on the roll. Nick says it was Bai speaking to him. I, I said, oh my God, that's my brother, name number. Unbelievable. You can see, look at the picture right now, that's number seven. The photo would be printed in newspapers and magazines around the world, having an enormous impact, creating a firestorm of outrage over Vietnam, a picture that would force the rest of the world to finally see the innocent victims of war, victims who now have a face. For Nick, it meant the Pulitzer Prize. For history, it meant one of the most iconic and powerful images of the 20th century. An overflow crowd gathers at the Libero Theater in Santa Barbara, all hoping for a chance to hear a 49-year-old woman speak. It is Kim Fook. Everyone here in this room has a story to tell but right now, this is my turn. <laughs> she has matured with grace and charm. A goodwill ambassador who is now comfortable telling her story. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is David. David, David. nice to meet you. Upon meeting her, I notice she's always at ease, smiling, remarkably open. Our conversation starts with a memory of that painful day 40 years ago as she was fleeing the temple. I saw four bombs. And then I heard, boop, 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 boop. Then suddenly the fire everywhere around me. And then the fire just burned off my clothes. Out of the fire and into the lens, her life of innocence in a small village was over. Her recovery would take years. In fact, she tells me the pain is still a daily part of life. It never goes away. 
She rolls up her sleeve, showing me her injuries. How many surgeries have you had? I got 17 operations. Her left arm, her entire back, her neck, all disfigured. Horrible scarring to her skin, but even more so to her self-esteem. Why me? I just ask all the time. I look at my friends. It's just a little thing that with the scars. I'm not pretty like them. I hated my life. Why I have to suffer like that? She tried to lead a normal life, but the scars and the pain made it impossible. Even her modest dream seemed out of reach. And every time I touch it, I scare myself to death. That's why I thought I'd never have a boyfriend, or get married, or even have a baby. Normal life. That my dream. And she candidly reveals that world-famous photo only added to her misery. First time when I saw that, I wish that picture not taken. Because that little girl, I feel like ugly and embarrassed. As she grew into an adult, her embarrassment gave way to conviction. The picture took on a whole new meaning. She realized there was a greater good she could serve. I learned that. I'm so thankful that he took that picture. I can use that suffering to help other people. It gives her purpose. She now travels the world speaking on behalf of innocent victims of war. We can extinguish the fires of war. Today, Kim's dreams have come true. She's married with two children. And even though she is famous all over the world, she has not used her image for profit. She lives a very modest life with little money. I live very humble. I don't have much, but I feel very rich because I help people with my love. Modest despite the fact that so many people are fascinated by her story. She draws thousands to her speeches, hanging on every compelling detail, giving her an opportunity to teach about adversity, faith, and forgiveness. After years of feeling shame over that photograph, she has discovered its invaluable purpose. Her greatest tool, a frozen moment in time 40 years ago that she will forever hate, but a picture she has learned to love. Horst and I arrived on assignment in Vietnam in 1962. I worked with him there for the next 10 years. Some people are said to be larger than life. Horst Fass was one of those. Physically big, an engaging personality, a demanding work ethic. He was much more sensitive than his persona suggested, but on the battlefield, he was absolutely fearless. He had an uncanny sense of the ebb and flow of action, positioning himself for the best pictures, and then methodically, commandingly, clicking off his film. Nick asked Horst for a job in 1965 at the funeral of his older brother, Win Kong La, an AP photographer who'd been killed in the Mekong Delta. Horst hired him, but he came not only his boss, but basically a foster parent. He uh, taught him the dark room and eventually sent him out as a war photographer. The day of the picture, an unforgettable day. Horst to assigned Nick on what we thought was a routine action story on Route 1. Nick had come back. Horst came out of the dark room and held up to my sight a strip of film. He handed me a magnifying glass. He said, look at this. You could see smoke and flames. A naked kid was in the picture. Fear jumped right out of that film. Someone in the office said, nudity, you'll never get that picture published. Horse said, I'll get it published. From what I have seen, the Kim Fook picture remains the most discussed of all the photographs published from the Vietnam War. It seems to have a life of its own. Maybe because its brutal message transcends just one war in Asia, to cover all wars. Horst was quoted as saying, 
It's a picture that doesn't rest. He also said such pictures of war need to be published because pain keeps you conscious. Every generation has to make their own mistakes, but to ignore the lessons of the past would be our biggest mistake of all. Get over there, come on! How do you teach a lesson about war? Not memorizing the facts from the pages of a history book, but truly understanding the consequences of war, where there is seldom right and wrong, only that gray area between, where victors are few, where the only thing in abundance is tragedy and heartbreak. How do you teach that lesson? I heard a lot of your reflections and they were really profound and, and you know, you make a teacher proud. Alethea Parody knows how. She runs Friendship Tours, a unique opportunity for high school students from all over to visit historically important locations. I said, let's go. Let's go investigate the consequences of war together, teachers and students, discovering what it is that these people have to teach us about how to heal. On this trip, She's taking students from Santa Barbara to Trang Bang, where the photo of Kim Fook was taken. Not only will they be able to immerse themselves in this iconic location, but they have the rare opportunity to hear all about it from people who were there and played a role in it. Nick, how far down do you think they'd come? But I reckon it's about there. Photographer Nick Oot and reporter Christopher Wayne are accompanying the students and share the memories of what that day was like. And where we were standing as press men was about half a mile down the road behind me. Wayne recaps what he saw with his own eyes and the student standing mere feet from where it happened. Now when the aircraft came in and it bombed the first time, it bombed just behind the temple. They started bringing the civilians out and making them run as quickly as they could down that road. Standing there with Wayne as he paints a picture with his words on what life was like for Kim her family, and the many innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. Now, kids are naturally compassionate, but you have to give them a reason to engage. When they see that photograph, they recognize themselves because she is a universal image of children. The students explore the temple, the streets, sit in Kim's family noodle house. They even have the opportunity to meet Ho Thi Hin, seen in Nick's photo running from the fire, holding her brother's hand. It makes her happy that young people, 40 years later, are still interested in what happened here. Okay, Nick, you better smile this morning. In nearby Ho Chi Minh City, they visit a war museum where Kim's photo hangs. As they stare at the picture, its importance now much clearer. All the pain, the sadness, the innocence. I have seen this picture countless of times before we came on this trip. Been the first time I saw it today, I stared at it for 10 minutes because it, it was like it was a whole new picture. After hearing Kim's story, I had a whole new perspective of it. It's like a completely different picture. The museum is filled with other images of war. Each photo, another victim. Many suffering from birth defects from Agent Orange. Human beings that most people around the world will never hear about. A heartbreaking realization for these young minds. I'm glad I came, but it's still really, it's shocking, and I mean, it shouldn't be shocking. We should, we should already know about it, we should understand it, but it's a real shock. Seeing it here, it gives the emotional aspect, obviously, and it puts it in more like real life, three-dimensional perspective versus 2D flipping through a book, and right. you feel the pages, but you don't feel the emotion. We're headed to the park right now and we're going to do a little journal writing and reflection on what you guys just saw and experienced. When you bring kids to the places where things happen, that's when the magic happens. As these students sit in a Vietnamese park reflecting on what they just experienced, the words spill out onto their pages like magic. I held back my tears. I don't like to show emotion in public. I want to cry so bad. It is imperative that we draw from history's previous mistakes. If we don't, then all the sacrifices made, all the tears shed, and all the lives lost are in vain. I've seen the girl in the picture countless of times, but having Chris and Nick in the same building as me changed my perspective on the photo. 
One question I have is, did this picture just capture the war or shape it? Did this picture capture the war or shape it? Wise words from a 16-year-old. It was ugly, brutal, in every way imaginable. Get a move and back up. It tore you personally Set up, up two, on the inside on for having to do the things you had to do. Vietnam War veteran Jim Nolan suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. And teaching this unique class at UC Santa Barbara is his therapy. The course was the first of its kind in the country where actual veterans tell their stories. The reason I've never talked to my children about this, and they're in their 40s now, is that I don't want them thinking of their daddy as a killer, as someone who goes around killing people. But I did. Talking about his shame, his trauma, his role in a war few can understand has helped him deal with the sadness. As a 19-year-old, Nolan saw some brutal violence in the nine months he spent as a Marine in the jungle. He admits to killing many, losing close friends, and being wounded three different times. But one action in particular is what wrecked him. He was ordered to clear out a hole on the side of a hill in case enemy soldiers were hiding in it, as they often did. I took the grenade and yelled, Ladai, in there, which means come here, and uh, didn't hear anything. Uh, so I pulled the pin on the grenade and threw the, uh, threw the grenade in the hole. What was actually in the hole was a young 17 or 18 year old girl and maybe a four or five month old baby. And they were hiding from the Americans. They'd been told stories by the Viet Cong that the Americans were going to rape their women and, you know, eat their children. And uh, uh, so they were afraid of us. She was just hiding from the Americans, but she was dead. And that baby was dead. And I remember just staring. There's no coming back from that. There's no saying I'm sorry. There's no do-overs. She was dead. And the baby was dead. And I have to live with it. When Jim returned from the war, he was met by angry crowds of college-age students calling the troops baby killers, a term especially painful to Jim. He crawled into an emotional shell and stayed there for decades. I see those bodies all the time. When the photo of Kim Fook hit the world in 1972, it was like reliving a nightmare. Jim, like many veterans, couldn't bear to look at it. It revealed everything that was wrong with the war. They went there to fight the Viet Cong, known as the VC, but so often, that's not what happened. To me personally, it's a reminder of, of the horror and of the, cl the collateral damage of the, the, the woman and her baby and the fact that a lot of the villages that we shot into didn't just have VC in it, they also had women and children and uh, there was a lot of civilian casualties. We would just count their bodies as VC. This picture just brings back a lot of the, those memories of the chaos of war. Ironically, young adults have gone from being Jim's hell to his salvation. The empathy he sees in their eyes is cathartic. Those emotions he tucked away so long ago are slowly resurfacing. Kim Fook's picture will always torment him, but at least now he can look at it, talk about it, even use it in his classroom. To the world, the picture is a dark truth so many were ignorant to, but to our troops who were there, it's simply a reminder of something they spend the rest of their lives trying to forget. Forty years ago, a split second told a story that was so dynamic, it changed us. Where the details are so compelling, it's as if we stood there and watched it happen. It even shocked President Nixon, who, on a secret tape, thought it might be fake. I wonder if that was a fix. Could have been. But the pain and scars are real. So is the suffering and the loss. So many similar moments have escaped the lens and only live in the haunting memories of those who wish they could forget. 
But this image lives on. Our present decisions now are going to be history tomorrow. Still moving people who can make a difference. For the journalists who saw it happen, the combination of the film and the still had an enormous impact. They bore the heavy responsibility of showing the world after first playing the most human of roles, helping their fellow man. And for the little girl, her life will forever be defined by tragedy. She will never escape this moment, a slave to this picture. But with that comes awesome power in telling her story that she truly believes can change the world. It's a photograph that, that lives for the ages. She was the definition of what it means to be valiant, to survive, to endure, and to see past the hate, the anger, the insanity of war, and continue to live on.